This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehyes Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. I remind all parties of the need to respect international law, including ensuring the safety and security of all United Nations and associated personnel and humanitarian aid workers. That's UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemning the violence in Sudan. Details coming up. Also, the death toll from a Saturday night attack by gunmen in Nigeria has risen to 33. And a South African court orders a four-month postponement in the trial of former President Jacob Zuma. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. The East African regional bloc, IGAD, says the presidents of South Sudan, Kenya and Djibouti will travel to Sudan in an effort to broker an immediate ceasefire as fighting between rival military forces rages in Khartoum. VOA's Mariama Diallo has the story from Nairobi. As Sudan was rocked by fighting for the third day in a row, IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, said Kenyan President William Ruto, South Sudanese President Salva Kiir, and Djibouti's President Ismail Omar Gele will go to Khartoum in an effort to broker an immediate ceasefire. Nur Mohamed Sheikh is spokesperson for IGAD's executive secretary. He talked to VOA via WhatsApp. President uh, Salva Kiir, who has been in touch already with both uh, General Burhan and General um, uh, Hebeti to convey uh, the message of the summit uh, yesterday. And so now they are just preparations is underway for them to uh, undertake this mission. This comes after IGAD called for an immediate and unconditional cessation of hostilities between the warring parties in Sudan during an emergency virtual session of heads of states and government on Sunday. Sheikh told VOA. They must uh, stop fighting in uh, civilian inhabited uh, areas and uh, open humanitarian uh, corridors. So they constituted a committee of three heads of states who are highly experienced, knowledgeable on the Sudan uh, situation, to uh, undertake a mission to visit Khartoum uh, and reach out to all the Sudanese stockholders to make sure that uh, you know there is a cessation of hostilities and the parties uh, return to uh, Sheikh said the conflict undermines the peace process achieved over the last four months. He added that East African countries are closely linked, so any outbreak of violence in one country has security, economic, social, and humanitarian implications for its neighbors. Fighting broke out on Saturday in the Sudanese capital Khartoum between the Sudan Armed Forces Unit, led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, head of Sudan's Transitional Governing Sovereign Council, and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, led by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hamedti, who is deputy head of the council. The clashes have so far left nearly 100 people dead and 600 injured, according to the International Rescue Committee, which has since stopped its operations in most parts of the country. Mariama Jalou, VOA News, Nairobi. Today, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the violence in Sudan and called for those with influence on the fighting to work to bring peace. The humanitarian situation in Sudan was already precarious and is now catastrophic. I condemn the deaths and injuries to civilians and humanitarian workers and the targeting and looting of premises. I remind all parties of the need to respect international law, including ensuring the safety and security of all United Nations and associated personnel and humanitarian aid workers. I have spoken during the weekend with the two Sudanese leaders and I am actively engaging with the AU, the Arab League and leaders across the region. And I reaffirm that the United Nations stands with the people of Sudan at this very difficult time with full support for their efforts to restore the democratic transition 
and build a peaceful, secure future. Sudan's military and the Rapid Support Forces Paramilitary, RSF, have battled for control of key sites in Khartoum and other cities for three days. General Abdel Fattah Borhan leads the armed forces and General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, known as Hameti, commands the RSF. Earlier today, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and U.K. Foreign Secretary James Cleverly called for a ceasefire. We have been consulting very closely on the situation uh, in Sudan. Uh, we've also been in close touch with partners in the Arab world, uh, in Africa, in the international organizations. There is a shared deep concern uh, about the fighting, uh, the violence that's going on in Sudan, the threat that that poses to civilians, that it poses to the Sudanese nation, and potentially poses even to uh, the region. Um, there's also a very uh, strongly shared view about the need for Generals Burhan and Hamedi to ensure the protection of uh, civilians and non-combatants, uh, as well as people from uh, third countries, including uh, our personnel who are located in Sudan. And also uh, a strongly held view, again, across all of our partners on the need for an immediate ceasefire and a return to talks, talks that were very promising in putting Sudan on the path to a uh, full transition to civilian-led government. That was UN Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The two top diplomats discussed Sudan and the sidelines of a meeting in Tokyo of foreign ministers from the G7 group of leading democracies. UK Foreign Secretary Cleverly joined Blinken in condemning the fighting. The UK has been in contact with our friends in the Arab region and will continue to uh, do so. But I echo the points that have been uh, made already by Secretary Blinken, that we call upon an immediate cessation of violence, a return to the talks, talks which seem to be heading in the direction of uh, civilian government, and of course that is the ultimate desired uh, outcome. And we will continue working both with our close friends in the United States of America and our friends uh, in Africa and the wider Arab world to bring about that move towards uh, peace and a civilian democracy. Both said they are in close contact with their diplomatic staff in Sudan and are working to ensure the safety of nationals from their countries. Both governments recommend against traveling to Sudan. The deadly fighting that broke out over the weekend in Sudan between two factions of the military continues for a third day. A doctor's professional group in Sudan says in a statement today that at least 97 civilians have been killed on the crossfire, in the crossfire. Jeffrey Felt Feltman is a visiting fellow with the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution and former Special Envoy to the Horn of Africa with the U.S. State Department. He has met in Khartoum with both Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, head of the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, and Abdel Fattah Al-Burhan, the leader of the Sudan Army, and he says both men have institutional resentments and ethnic jealousies. And for the past four years, they have had a partnership that has to the outside world, looked as though they were being supportive of transitional arrangements from Sudan, while inside they were actually undermining this all, all the way. They agreed on things like no accountability for justice, including the genocide in Darfur you know, back in 2003, no civilian control over the security services. They're, they had a lot in common despite their institutional, ethnic, bureaucratic differences. But big question not answered. If they succeeded in derailing the civilian transition, who was going to be on top? So what we have now is a fight for power. It's a a lust for power. Who is going to prevail among these two generals? So this they have this marriage of. But if they've already agreed, they both of them agreed and signed this Sudan peace agreement, saying that they will transition to a civilian-led government. What about that? Both both of them and the forces behind them, their colleagues as well, have have made multiple commitments, commitments to each other, commitments to the Sudanese people, which is the most important, commitments to the international community, and they've broken them all. We see time and time again, Burhan and and, um, Hamedi and their their, um, partners making commitments and then breaking them. And this is only the most recent one. You know, they had made, they had agreed to a plan that had been carefully negotiated by the 
by the UN, the African Union, the sub-regional group for Africa called IGAD about transfer to civilian control that should have happened a week or so ago. So this is yet another example that they've uh, commitment made and commitment broken. We've seen this repeatedly. You know, if nothing else, I would hope that all of us have learned what the, what the Sudanese civilians have long suspected is that these guys aren't reformers. These guys have not bought into the process that they said they were, that they were supporting. So is that why the faction of the pro-democracy forces said, no, we're not going to be a part of this and we're not signing on to this agreement because we know these guys, you're still including them in the transitional government? Yes, a lot of the a lot of the, the representatives of the so-called resistance committees, these decentralized movement in favor of democracy and civilian rule in Sudan, they were skeptical about this agreement that was being put together with civilian, gov- civilian government because they did not trust the generals. They did not trust the generals would actually cede power to civilian authorities, and they also questioned how inclusive this arrangement was. Nevertheless, it is another example of the generals feeling threatened by by a transition that might have diminished their power, that might have diminished the monopoly that they control. What about the international community? Are they at fault here for not ironing this out in the peace agreement in the first place? We, we, you know, I look back at my own time as U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, and I'm haunted by what happened in October, 20, in October 2021. I was in Sudan at the request of the Biden administration, um, the transition at the time seemed to be faltering. It was based on a civilian military partnership that had been put in place after the overthrow of Omar Bashir in 2019. The civilian military partnership was showing strains. It was showing um, fault lines. And we were there to try to address these concerns and, and put some new momentum behind them. I met with General Burhan one-on-one. I met with General Burhan with colleagues. I met with, we met with General Hamedi. We met with the civilian prime minister, Tom Hamdok, to try to figure out how we in the international community could, could revive the momentum behind this partnership that was supposed to lead to democratic elections in 2024. Generals Hamedi and Burhan told us, well, they insisted, these are our concerns. They listed a number of concerns. So we tried in good faith to address these concerns. Their concerns were, were that the that the civilian government was not was not sufficiently repre- representative. They were concerned about sort of dysfunction and divisions among the civilian side. But five hours later, even five hours after making a commitment to us that they agreed with the proposals we had tabled on how to address their concerns, they arrested the civilian prime minister who'd been in the meetings with us. They arrested the entire cabinet. They arrested others. That clarified for me that they had been playing us. Nigerian lawmakers are investigating allegations of uh, 2.4 billion in illegal sales of stolen oil to China. Nigerian authorities say they have struggled to halt the loss of billions of dollars a year in oil theft. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. The House of Representatives Ad Hoc Committee on Oil Theft resumed its probe on the unofficial sales in 2015 of 48 million barrels of crude oil to China. Lawmakers were tipped off about the deal by a whistleblower in July 2020. The whistleblower alleged that the stolen crude had been stored at several Chinese ports and later sold by Nigeria's national oil company NNPC Limited officials. NNPC Limited denies the allegation and called it false. Chinese authorities have not responded. This week, Nigeria's finance minister, attorney general and other top cabinet members did not appear for interrogation on the matter at a hearing. The committee says that could delay the investigation. Faith Nwadishi is the executive director of the Center for Transparency Advocacy. 48 million barrels of crude taken out of the country is almost equivalent to about 50 days oil production or less. We don't really have strong uh, structures and systems in place. It's really not the first time um, it's it's going to happen. And um, I I don't think it's the last time it's going to happen until we get our structures right. If uh, the legislative arm invites... Between 2011 and 2015 and said it will investigate. Crude oil accounts for more than 90% of Nigeria's revenue and Nigerian authorities have been trying to stem oil theft for decades. Officials say the country loses $700 million every month as a result. 
Last year, President Mohamed Buhari said the trend was putting the country's economy in a precarious situation. Emmanuel Afimia, head of an Abuja-based oil and gas consulting firm, says corruption is the reason oil theft has persisted in Nigeria. Corruption has been the main factor that has hindered, hindered the growth of the sector. If the country is actually serious about stopping oil theft, corruption has to be completely eliminated. You have to address corruption from the highest office of this country. Last year, Nigerian authorities awarded a controversial contract to 10 TITA security services, an oil pipeline surveillance team headed by an ex-Niger Delta militia group in an effort to address oil theft issues. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Nigerian aviation employees blocked roads to the domestic terminal of Lagos Airport today, slowing traffic and threatening to delay flights as they began a two-day strike to protest working conditions and wages. Reuters reports the strike is likely to add to problems in a sector that regularly faces jet fuel shortages, grounding flights, and where international carriers struggle to repatriate revenue from ticket sales due to a shortage of foreign currency. The workers have threatened to strike indefinitely later this month if their grievances are not addressed. Earlier in the federal capital Abuja, workers blocked the main toll road to the South African court. Today ordered a fourth month postponement in the much delayed trial of former President Jacob Zuma, who faces charges of corruption in an arms scandal dating to the late 1990s. According to the French news agency AFP, the high court in the eastern city of Pieter Martisberg said it was postponing the case after Zuma's attorney submitted a fresh bid to prosecutor Billy Downer to be recused. Zuma's trial got underway in May 2021 only to run into a string of legal delays. The 81-year-old faces 61 count, 16 counts of fraud, graft, and racketeering relating to a contract to buy fighter jets, patrol boats, and equipment from the five European arms firms while he was vice president. He served as president from 2009 to 2018 before being forced out over allegations of corruption in the state sector. Two journalists in northern Cameroon are calling for government protection after witnesses say a mayor publicly threatened to kill them for investigating corruption in road construction contracts. The Cameroon Journalist Trade Union has condemned the threat, which came after the killings in January of two reporters who were outspoken on corruption. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Journalists in Cameroon say Sali Babani, the mayor of Marwa, a city near the northern border with Chad and Nigeria, publicly threatened several times this month to kill reporters there. The Cameroon Journalist Trade Union, in a statement April 8, said the mayor threatened freelance reporter Usman Ali Bubakari for asking about accountability on development projects. Bubakari, in his Facebook account, had accused the mayor of abandoning some road construction projects in Marwa. 34-year-old trader Muhammad Hamidu says he was present when Babani, during an event at a road project, publicly threatened reporters who criticized his work. Hamidou says he was scared when he heard the Marwa city mayor during a public ceremony at Kakatare last week threatening to either punish or kill journalists for reporting that some public projects have been abandoned. He says Cameroon's government should investigate why the mayor threatened to kill journalists instead of explaining why the road projects have not been completed as the Marwa Council promised. The Journalist Union says the mayor also threatened to kill Douala-based Channel 2 International's correspondent Aminu Alium. Alium and Bubakari say they also received several anonymous calls threatening violence if they do not stop critical reports against the mayor. 
Alim spoke to VOA on Friday via a messaging application from Marwa. He says Bubakari received death threats from the Marwa city mayor for reporting that some roads in Marwa and construction work on the Kakatari junction in the same city have been abandoned. Alim says the mayor threatened him for taking pictures of the abandoned projects. He says the death threats from the Marwa city mayor add to other threats and intimidation. Reporters along Cameroon's northern border with Chad and Nigeria regularly get from Boko Haram militants. Babani refused to respond to VOA's questions on the threats, which journalists also took to the police. The spokesperson for Cameroon's police would not comment on the threats, but told VOA it was their duty to protect all citizens. Alium and Bubakari say the threats will not stop them from carrying out their work as reporters, but joined the journalist union in calling for the government to ensure their safety. Cameroon's government has not yet commented on the journalist's plea for protection. The mayor's threats of violence against the media come less than two months in Cameroon. The mutilated remains of Martinez Zogu, a popular radio announcer and journalist who have found January 22 in Yaoundé. Police arrested 20 people in connection with the killing, including senior police intelligence officers and a well-known media mogul, Jean-Pierre Amugu Belinga. On his radio program, Zogo had accused Belinga and several government ministers of planning to kill him for his reporting on their alleged corrupt deals. Radio presenter Jean-Jacques Olabebe was also found shot dead on February 2 outside his home in the capital. Like Zogo, Bebe was an outspoken critic of government corruption. Moki Edwin Kinzuka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. Uganda's junior finance minister, Amos Lugo Lobi, was charged today with corruption for alleged involvement in diversion of government-owned roofing materials, a case that has ensnared other officials. Reuters news agency says police investigators and prosecutors in the East African country have been looking into the alleged theft and diversion of metal roofing sheets meant for a relief program in the rest of northeastern Karamoja region bordering Kenya and South Sudan. Lugolobi, who has been in custody since Friday, was charged with dealing with suspect property. He pleaded not guilty. Lugolobi was the second minister to be charged. Police say they are processing the files of several other officials, including ministers who are facing potential charges. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest development on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Baro, and our engineer, Bill Androdi, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.